In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Probably if you, I know when you were disconnected, I was asking more questions to David. Maybe if I ask, if I continue, one more question. So, from you, your experience so far, what we should be doing to bring more people to the ancient apostolic and universal Ethiopian Orthodox Tohaidu Church. And you can also share the experience of the Syrian Orthodox Church, how, how they bring more people to their faith. Yes. Well, I would say first and foremost, we need to actually be spreading our faith. For example, I'll give you an example. When I was at my church in Memphis, I said to them, you know, we have so many people in this community, so many African Americans, so many whites who are lost, who are looking for a church to call home, who want to know about the ancient church. They've never heard of our faith. Hmm. We need to have more English services. We need to have more outreach. We need to have barbecues and inviting people to the church for sing-alongs or mesmers or anything like that. Our church has so many unique things to offer. We have a million different ways that we can bring people. Do you know what their response was and what the response of the church board was? It was that, well, you know, they can come to us. We, we don't need to spread the faith. If people are interested, they will come to us. We don't need to have English services. We don't need to have barbecues. We don't need to have any of that. If people are interested, they'll come. But what they don't realize is, as I said earlier, no one knows our church exists. No one knows anything about our church. Even our own church doesn't know certain parts of it exists. Up in Memphis, there's an Ethiopian church and a Coptic church eight minutes apart from each other. Neither of them had any idea the other existed until I came along and I introduced the two of them to each other. Because when I was made a deacon, I brought the Coptic priest to my first Holy Kadashi service where I served for the first time. And that was the first and only time that those two churches had actually had interaction with each other in over 17 years of them both being there. So that should say something. Even between our own people, we're not talking to each other. We're not introducing them to each other. We have to do better about spreading our faith. But the second thing is, we need more English outreach. And I don't just say this as a deacon, I say this as a children's minister at our church. I teach our children in the church every week, both in person and online, and I am telling the parents who are watching this, I am telling any of our Orthodox who are older, and who maybe have kids themselves, or have a niece or nephew or cousin or whatever, who is in the church, we're losing our young people. We are losing them, and we're losing to the, the Protestant churches. We're losing them to things that aren't even Christian. We're losing them to the Buddhists. We're losing them to atheism. We're losing them to agnosticism. We're losing them to Islam. And why is that? Because we have no English. And for some reason, we have got this horrid mindset that, oh, well, our children grew up here, but they've grown up in these families that are Ethiopian or Coptic or Syrian or Armenian or Indian, so they'll just pick up on the language. They'll pick up on the language of the Kadasi. They'll understand the Amharic eventually. They'll understand the Ge'ez eventually. Or I've even heard, you know, I've even heard a few parents tell me point blank when I said, you know, why don't we have an English service? Why don't we have more English outreach? Oh, the Holy Spirit will teach them. The Holy Spirit will guide them from the Amharic and Gies. They don't need English. The Holy Spirit will teach them our language. It, it, leave it up to the Holy Spirit. You know, and I teach English. So I teach English lessons to the children every week, as Kessis Getty well knows, as Brother David well knows. I've had parents come up to me after my teaching to the kids, and they said, oh, you did such a wonderful job. But when are you going to learn Amharic so you can teach the children in the true language of the church? When are you going to learn... Uh, Amharic, so you can really teach them in our proper language. That's the attitude we have in this church, and it cannot be done. Our children go to school where they're taught in English. When they interact with their friends, it's all in English. Anything they're going out and doing with friends, recreational activities, going out, hanging out, anything they're doing, games they're playing, books they're reading, it's all in English. The only time they have Amharic and Gies is in the church. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we need to throw out Gies. I'm not saying we need to throw out Amharic. But what I am saying is we need a lot more English. And we need a lot more English services because we're losing our children. And we're converting no one. I will give you an example. 
And a good example of that, there was a man at the Ethiopian church that I knew, and his name was Cody. Now, Cody is a white man like me, and he had been part of the Ethiopian church for 10 years. He married into it. He had an Ethiopian wife. He had two or three Ethiopian children, and, but I had never seen him at the church. One day, however, during the celebration of Meskel, that's the celebration of the finding of the Holy Cross by St. Helena and St. Constantine the Great, that day on Meskel, I was serving in my deacon uniform. I, we were outside. We had the giant bonfire going. And I happened to look out in the audience, and I saw him in his Nutella. He's a tall man, probably six foot five, so he stands out in a crowd. But he saw me looking at him. And the second the service was over, he made a beeline for me. And he said, wow, are you a priest? And I had to tell him, no, no, I'm, a, I'm just a deacon. But he was questioning me. He said, how can someone like you be a deacon in this church? And I said, lots of study and lots of practice. And we talked for a while, and I found out that this man, this poor man, was baptized in the church, but he knew nothing about the faith. He came on the holidays, on the holy days like Christmas and Easter and Mestel, but he didn't really know anything about the church. At our church, we have no English services at all. The entirety is of heart and geese. And this poor man, he came, and he sat there with his wife because he loved his wife. But he knew nothing about the church. He knew nothing about what we taught. He knew nothing. He was a Baptist in heart, and all he knew was Baptist terminology. He didn't even know about the Holy Eucharist. So I sat with him, and I tried to explain it all for a while. But I said to him, you know what? You need to go to the Coffin Church down the street. Now, the Coffin Church is our sister church, but here's the kicker. Unlike us, they've embraced English. They're having full English services. They have English morning prayers, English evening prayers, English sermons, English everything. And even at the Church of Memphis, they have mostly English services. So I sent Cody to Father Titus at the, at the Coffin Church down the road. I said, there's one only eight minutes away from here. Well, guess what? Cody went a full time. He had dinner with Father Titus. He's Coptic now. All it took was experiencing a single English service, and he was hooked. He messaged me afterwards. He said, oh, I loved it. I had a wonderful time. I could actually understand what was going on. It was so beautiful. And all it took was having English in the service, and he was ready. He's still going to the Coptic Church to this day. I went there recently uh, in Easter. I gave a sermon at that Coptic Church on Easter. While I was there, I saw him. So he's still going to the Coptic Church to this day. And why is that? Because they have English. They have a little bit of English. People are to learn about our faith. I will tell you this. They don't even have full English, by the way. They have a mixture. It's English, Coptic, and Arabic, but they have some English of the service, and people are coming. People mm -hmm. are interested in the churches. The Coptic churches are doing outreach either. They're not reaching out to the local communities either, although I've been pushing to, and I wish they would. But even though they're not doing that, people are still coming anyway, and they're staying. They read about our church. They want to know about our church. If we just had something like at a cookout once a month, invite people to come taste Ethiopian food. That's something really unique that no other church could offer. If we have once a month a mesmer service, where we just sit there and pray mesmers on the on the drum, on the kibero, or have those beautiful instruments in the church, no one's ever heard anything like that before. People will come and they'll get interested and they'll stay. But we have to have some kind of outreach. Here in Mississippi, as I said, we don't have a church. We have no church here. I'm trying to build one from the ground up. And you know how I'm doing that? Wearing my cross, telling people about our church. Trying to, I let them listen to hymnals from our church. I let them listen to sermons that I've recorded for our church. I'm trying to introduce them to the church that way. I'm slowly growing a community here. I'm doing it. I'm a white guy who converted less than three years ago, and I'm trying to have an outreach. I've converted several people. What are our own people doing? Where are they? That's not to sound precocious, but I'm fleeing here. I'm fleeing here. People will just look at me and they say, oh, you can bring people. Well, why can't you? What are you doing? They call me the evangelist because I brought five people to the church. If I can be called the evangelist just by bringing five people, that's a very sad number. What, what are we doing to bring more? We're not. And I beg of our people 
Invite someone you know. Just one day out of the week, say to someone you know, a co-worker, a family member, a friend, hey, I go to this church. Come with me. Come see the church that Jesus founded. Come see this beautiful church that Jesus made. Challenge yourself to invite at least one person to come with you. Even if you only do that once a month. Once a year, reach out. You never know who will be interested. Look at me. I'm a pasty white guy from Mississippi, which for some reason most people know is the most racist state in America. It's not, by the way, but that's the side. Right? If someone like me can join the Open Orthodox Church, you never know who will be interested in our faith. You have to try. Never be afraid to say, I'm part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Invite them. Give one more example. Tess has asked me about this. The Syrian Orthodox Church. Again, that's the Syrian Orthodox Church. They're based in Antioch. That's halfway around the world. That's near Jerusalem. They have nothing to do with English. They have much less to do with Spanish or French or any other languages. But guess what? The Syrian Orthodox Church has in, in Guatemala now, in South America, a massive church of two million people in South America. Do you know how they did that? They started making Spanish Corbana. They started making Spanish liturgy. And they started spreading the faith organically that way. And people started coming. There are so many disenfranchised Roman Catholics in Guatemala. So many Protestants who don't know where to go for the true church. And it's the Roman Catholics that are tired of Roman Catholic politics. And so where do they turn? Orthodoxy. And the Syrian Orthodox Church was smart enough to embrace them and say, yes, you can be part of our church. And they allowed them to keep things, like statues, for example. They allowed them to keep some parts of the Roman Catholic Mass, but they also had them embrace the Syrian Orthodox Church. And just by allowing a couple of Roman Catholic practices, just by allowing Spanish in their services, they went. They started in 2013. And since 2013, they had 2 million people. They have a Spanish archbishop. His name is Archbishop Eduardo. That's not, that's not Syrian in the slightest. That's very Hispanic. And yet he's an archbishop in the Syrian Orthodox Church. If we go back 200 years in the Syrian Orthodox Church, they were doing this thing 200 years ago in the 1800s. There are white bishops in the Syrian Orthodox Church. For example, uh, in the 1800s, in two little countries of Ceylon and Goa, there was a crisis in the Roman Catholic Church back then a political crisis involving the Portuguese. Many of the Roman Catholic churches there split from the Roman Catholic Church and became independent Catholic. And when they did that, some of those churches started reaching out to the Syrian Orthodox Church. And the Syrian Orthodox Church accepted them into their own. It was one priest in particular. His name was Alvarez, or Alvarez Julius and Xavier. Now, Father Alvarez Julius and Savior found this Syrian Orthodox Church and said, Hey, I'd like to join you guys. We're Roman Catholic, but we would really like to join you. If we could just keep some of our practices, if we could just keep the mass, we believe everything you believe. We're willing to say the creed as you do. We're willing to accept your patriarch as our patriarch. And the Syrian Orthodox Church was smart enough to say yes to that proposal. They allowed these Roman Catholics to join their church. They made Alvarez Julius an archbishop in their church. A Roman Catholic priest is now an archbishop. They allow all of their clergy to stay clergy, just now part of the Syrian Orthodox Church. They welcome them in, just like they did with the Syrian Orthodox Church in Guatemala today. That church, by the way, was called the Independent Catholic Syrian Orthodox Church. And the Orthodox Church in Guatemala today is called the Mayan. Syrian Orthodox Church. The Syrian Orthodox Church is not afraid to allow these other churches to keep some of their traditions as long as they accept the Syrian Orthodox faith, the Oriental Orthodox faith. And because of that, they brought thousands of people to the Syrian Orthodox Church. 200 years ago, Alvarez Julius became Mar Archbishop Alvarez Julius, and his main priest, R.C. Norona, became uh, Father uh, Kasha Noroha of the Syrian Orthodox Church. Both of these men are now considered saints in our church. Both of these men were Roman Catholic. They didn't know the first thing about our church. And now they made a church that 
brought thousands to our faith 200 years ago. And those churches still exist to this day. You can go to Ceylon and Goa, and you will find these Latin Syrian Orthodox churches, where they are practicing the Roman Catholic Mass in Syrian Orthodox tradition, where they're practicing all of these things because they were allowed to keep them, and they're still Syrian Orthodox this day. It's called the Brahmavar Diocese. It's still around to this very day. Many churches were also founded uh, by, under the Syrian Orthodox Church by a man named René Vallant. But here was a Roman Catholic. He was a white man, just like me. And yet he found the Syrian Orthodox Church, just like I did. And he was a priest, the Roman Catholic Church, and they made him an archbishop uh, with the command to go and make disciples in the West. This man, he went to America. He went to France. He went to England. He thousands of people to the church in these countries. And many of those churches still exist to this day. Now, unfortunately, a lot of them are not part of the Syrian Orthodox Church because uh, not long after Rene Balat passed away, the Syrian Orthodox Church was involved with the genocide that the Ottomans caused. As I mentioned before, the Syrian genocide, the Armenian genocide, those were happening around the same time that Archbishop Rene Balat was spreading the faith. And so many of those churches lost connection with the Orthodox Church. But many of those churches still exist. Many of them still practice the Syrian Orthodox faith. For example, the British Orthodox Church came out of the name a lot, and the British Orthodox Church is part of the Coptic Church to this day. They reconciled in 1994. They're still part of the Coptic Church. It's an entirely white parish of white believers that are part of the Oriental Orthodox faith. The British Orthodox, you can look them up. And there's many churches like that. But that is my point. The Syrian Orthodox Church today and 200 years ago was doing outreach. They had white bishops in their past. They had, now they have Spanish bishops. They have Guatemalan bishops in their parish. They have former bishops to be Roman Catholic who are now Syrian Orthodox. They have people from all backgrounds, all faiths, all creeds, all religions who are now part of the Syrian Orthodox Church all over the world. Over 2 million people who have nothing to do with Antioch nothing to do with Syria, who have nothing to do with being a Syrian, are now part of their church. And meanwhile, can we say the same? Absolutely not. And that is what I'm saying. We need far more outreach. You never know who will be interested in joining. If the Syrian Orthodox Church could make white bishops 200 years ago in a time where racism was rampant here in America in a time where every race was segregated from one another. If that church was willing to accept white bishops of all things, if they're today willing to accept Spanish bishops in a place like Guatemala where no one even knows what Orthodox is, before the Syrian Orthodox Church came that there were maybe three Orthodox churches in the entirety of Guatemala. If they can do it, what are we doing? Why are we not spreading the faith? There's so many people in today, who are part of the Rastafari movement, for example, who talk about Haile Selassie being a god among men. And why do they do that? Because they want to go back to Africa. They want to go back to the traditions of the African and their African ancestors, but they don't know where to look. They never heard of our church. If we just showed them, introduced it to them, did, invited them, they would come and they would stay. The Syrians have done it. The Coptic Church has done it. The Indian Orthodox Church has done it. We have no excuse anymore. We need to have English services. We need to have English outreach. We need to be doing things in multiple languages. We're coming whether you like it or not. So either the Internet, online, we're coming, we're exploring, we're learning. I met uh, Deacon Logan. Deacon Logan is hooked up with people from – there's no longer – you can't stop this. So you can't stop this movement. This is a movement beyond someone's personality or personal power or personal prestige. This is a movement that is happening – Many of us are going to come, and if we don't, if we aren't invited the right way, we're going to come the wrong way. I'll give you an example. There's a church in Chicago. I hope Deacon Logan doesn't laugh, but it's called the Black Coptic Church of America. And it's actually it's someone who took some Coptic symbols, he took some liturgy, and he put something together in Chicago, and he has a church, and he has a couple of hundred people who actually joined this church who believe that he's actually Coptic. Now, there's Catholic churches right in Chicago. Why you say, why would he do that? Because in the neighborhood that he's in, the south side, there's no Catholic church. There's no outreach. And the reason people join these schematic, made-up movements 
it's because of the lack of outreach. So people are going to get it one way or another. They're going to give it the right way or they're going to give it the wrong way. Unwittingly, believe it or not, schismatic groups actually promote orthodoxy, believe it or not. Me going through all of these different crazy different groups and organizations help lead me to or, 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 or orthodoxy. There are Protestants who teach and use orthodoxy to defend themselves, and they expose people to orthodoxy. Uh, Dr. Vince Bantu, for example, is a leading uh, uh, African American. He's actually he's actually biracial. He's a leading apologetic for Christianity against uh, uh, non-Christian groups, and he uses the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. He uses the Orthodox Church. He teaches them hard because he has a PhD from Catholic University. He teaches them hard. He teaches it. I took his hard course. And he's unwittingly exposing people to orthodox. He doesn't even know it. And when you ask him, why aren't you orthodox? He says, well, I just like my church. That's why. So the most important thing is that let's focus on creed. Let's get people to get the creed right. And then the rest we can work on later. Whether they whether Nutella right or turn to the left right or turn to the right left or which prostration or go circambulate in the circle to the left or circambulate in the circle to the right. Those things can be worked on, but let's get the liturgy right. And in all this in a bright spot, uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tahito Church in the Caribbean has done a tremendous job and there are lots of services in English available online. I, uh, in Trinidad, I, don't, I know Deacon Logan probably knows they've got a complete break down step by step of the of the liturgy. Uh, there are some few bright spots. In the Caribbean, they've done a tremendous job because these parishes, these not parishes, these churches are pretty much autonomous now, and they're taking the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, uh, tradition. They've converted into the they converted into the language that Caribbean people can understand, and now they have Caribbean bishops, they have Jamaican bishops, they have Trinidad uh, priests, and they're able to do this. So all it takes is a few, and Cass is with the great work that you and Deacon are going to do. Once we get that critical mass, yeah. then those people will take those uh, principles and they'll convert it to a cultural style that people can understand. Of course, a mesmer uh, uh, will be differently depending on the culture, but it's still a mesmer as long as the foundation is right. So I think if we focus on the creed and the basics first, the rest will come together. So uh, sometimes we focus so much on the little, we miss the big story. So the glass model may be half empty, it's also half full. And that's what I want to say. I want to leave with that, that uh, it is an amazing experience. And just by wearing my cross out, you know, I wear a cross, every, I wear my cross everywhere, just me showing up at the cross. Or when I leave the church, I might wear this. I might show up at the supermarket. People are like, what's that? Are you, are you Muslim? Jewish? What is that? What are you doing? Why are you praying? Why are you going to the airport and you're making prayers? What are you? What, what kind of religion is this? By just practicing our faith openly, what we discussed, a lot of people will be curious about. And as I told Deacon Logan, if, if you don't make converts, you make friends. Uh, so, and that's what we need to do. And uh, that's what I say to anyone who wants to embrace this faith. It's just weird naturally. I'm not embarrassed that I'm a convert. I'm happy. Because I have experience that you can share and others have experience that you can share and we can work on this together. And remember, Kansas, your children and our children are going to end up marrying each other anyway. Yeah. So uh, do we want them to be uh, Southern Baptist or do we want them to be Ethiopian Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox? So we all have a lot of work. Very good. Very good. Thank you, David. So, well, you know, I think I'm airing them this part and I don't believe in the poll, but you know, I kind of like the mass, and you know, it's kind of like going to Golden Corral. You're just picking. Let me get some chicken. Let me get some fish. And let me grab this, and that's how it is in America. We we uh, Christianity is a buffet. We just pick and choose what we want. So we have to get the creed right. We have to get our people to have the correct belief. Once we have the correct belief, you'll find a lot of things uh, come together. And part of that is what we're doing is a form of church service right now. As my old my old denomination would say, that every day you talk about Christ, you're doing some kind of service. So it's not just on Sundays uh, at 10 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock. It's every day. And uh, 
uh, we just have to embrace that and move forward and continue to embrace people to the faith and bring them to the faith and, and do our prayers. And it will happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen one way or another. You know, we're going to come in the right way, or we're going to come in the wrong way. And sometimes God, you know, there's a saying, there's a colloquial saying that God works in mysterious ways. Sometimes people just have to stumble in the church. Yeah. That's the way it works. Yeah. 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 That's the way it works. Very good. It's really an interesting conversation, but we have to wrap up this conversation. I hope we're going to continue next week and the other weeks. I think we have a lot of topics to discuss about. Thank you, both of you, for your time. In the meantime, also, I would like to mention Dick uh, Logan and your dedication. Of course, you have this nice book. Uh, I'm sharing it to the, to the audience. The Orthodox Church is for all, and you have this book. And we will also put the links for those who would be interested in reading this book. I myself have uh, this book. Um, uh, and we'll have this the link for your book under this video under the description. Maybe I will give you Dick and Logan if you have uh, like a brief summary because we have to wrap up. Um, well, yes, the book is essentially encompassing what I have been speaking about, which is that this church is for everyone. When people in America see Oriental Orthodox Church, they automatically assume the church has to do with Asia. They see Ethiopian, they think, oh, that can only be for Ethiopians. They see Coptic, that can only be for Egyptians. They have no notion that these churches are for everyone and meant for everyone. Even though Jesus Christ said that we have to go forth and baptize all people of all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and that is the entire problem, they think we're an ethnic club. So I wrote my book to showcase my faith journey, first and foremost, how I came to this church, but also, more importantly, to give a multitude of reasons, both historically and theologically, as to why people should be interested in our church, why they would want to join our church. And I wrote it with all kinds of Christians and even non-Christians in mind. And I hope, and I tried to write it simply enough that anyone could pick it up and understand okay, here's the Oriental Orthodox Church, here's why you should join. And that's why I titled it, The Orthodox Church is for All, because it truly is for all. And I think that's something that both people who are listening to this and also our own Orthodox members need to realize, our church is for everyone. It's not just for Ethiopians. That's why we need English services. And that's why we need to be inviting people to our churches, because as Brother David said, they are already going to come on their own. They're already discovering our church on their own from the Internet, and they're either going to come to us and be brought into the church naturally because they're going to understand what's going on, because we're going to have outreach and reach out to these people and welcome them, or they're going to end up going to some kind of schismatic church, like Brother David said, the Black Coffee Church in Chicago, or as I know, the Zion Coffee Church in Jamaica, which is essentially nothing but a Rastafari movement. Uh, that has uh, had marijuana as a sacrament. So I, I concur with what Brother David said. If they're not coming to us, they're going to go somewhere else that they think is orthodox. And so we have to do our best to reach out to people and bring them, or they're going to end up walking astray. Jesus said that, to look for, that he will look for the lost sheep out of the 99, and he will bring that lost sheep home. So why aren't we? Very good. David, if you have I would like to say that, uh, especially those of you who are coming from my background, that you feel that God did not fulfill his promise that he would come for his people and that he would abandon you. And you feel, many of us who are African American, we feel frustrated by the history, the slavery, the racism, the challenges, the poverty, the ongoing challenges. And many of us ask, where is God in all this? And I'm telling you that you don't have to run to the nation. You don't have to run to the Moors or the Hebrew Israelites or this group or that group. You don't have to become a chemitologist, a hotepologist, or africologist. You don't have to do that. That you can come to the ancient church rooted in a continent that you were stolen from and don't know your roots. It's not necessary for you to go and relive all that pain and go through all that. But you can come home to the ancient, African, apostolic, universal church for everyone. 
Oriental Orthodox, the Ethiopian Orthodox, the Coptic, the Syriac, and that if you would just embrace the history and embrace the love, you will truly find the love of Jesus Christ. You will find an identity. You will find a home. You'll find a spiritual blessing. And you will be able to embrace a church that is beyond all the trappings of U.S. history. Of U.S. history and uh, British history and all these other histories and histories that are so horrible to you that you can avoid all that by coming home. As I stated, Deacon Logan, it was only through the Orthodox Church that a black man from Michigan, and me and Deacon Logan can talk about anything, and a white guy from Mississippi, it is only through the universal apostolic ancient church that we can come together in brotherhood and we can discuss any topic at all, honestly, forthrightly, and still be brothers in Christ. And that's the power of this church. Yes. Deacon Logan mentioned that he was United Methodist out of AME. If we were still AME and United Methodist, me and Deacon Logan wouldn't even talk to each other. We would just look at each other sideways. But we are both home in the Orthodox Church. So I'm saying, especially those of you coming from my cultural background, you don't have to go through all that. You don't have to go run around the world and invent something new or join some schismatic cult. Come home to the ancient apostolic universal faith. Amen. And God bless you. Amen. Thank you, boss. Thank you very much for your time and hope to see you next week again with another topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.